So to begin with the story of Buddhism and mythology, I want to begin by telling you a story. Now imagine, if you will, uh, a scene in a city in ancient India thousands of years ago. And on the outskirts of the city there lived a poor couple, a man and his wife. They were outcasts, shunned by polite society, with no opportunities, no way of making a decent living, no way of doing anything but eking out an impoverished existence on the margins of society. The wife fell pregnant and the happy couple were preparing for the birth. Then at one point, the wife says to the husband, my darling, I have a yearning. And the husband says, what is it? What is it that you want? And she said, I must have a mango. The husband says, my darling, I would do anything for you. You know that. I would, I would shift heaven and earth. I love you so much. And we are, you know, this is all we have. All I have is my love for you. But my dear, it's not the season for mangoes. There just aren't any mangoes to be had. She said, I know, my dear. I know, I know that there are, this is not the season and there aren't any mangoes. But still, I must have a mango. And he says, but my darling, there are no mangoes. I cannot get you a mango. She says, my dear, I know, I know. I don't mean to distress you or anything like that, but if you don't get me a mango, I will die right here. And so the husband, not knowing what to do, so depressed, so anxious, he wants to do everything to help his wife. And then he realized, ah, actually, they say that in the royal compound, the royal gardens, there is a magic mango tree that bears fruit all year round. And that magic mango tree is only for the king and his family. Now, it is, of course, death to take a mango from the royal mango tree. And yet, I have no choice. So he went. He waited till the cover of night, climbed the wall, snuck into the garden. Slowly and stealthily, he found his way among the guards. For even though an outcast is a person who is shunned by society, who has no education, who is never recognized as having any skills, an outcast knows one skill better than anyone else, the skill of being unseen. And so he found his way to the magic mango tree, climbed up it, and found an abundance of beautiful, sweet mangoes. Ready to pluck his mangoes, he noticed that the sun was just about to rise. <sighs> taken me too long, he thought. The sun's going to come up. There's no way I'm going to be able to escape without the cover of darkness to hide me. So he said, I'll have to wait. Stay up here in the mango tree the whole day and go in the, go in the evening. And as he was waiting in the mango tree, he heard some noises. And to his horror was coming towards him some figures. And he recognized it was none less than the king himself with his Brahmin advisor and teacher and two guards. And they came and sat beneath the magic mango tree. The king took a high seat. The Brahmin priest took a low seat. And he started to teach the king about the wisdom of statecraft, the rules for kings, the procedures, the right and wrong, what was appropriate and what was inappropriate for kings to do. And all the time that they were doing this, the outcast was hanging above their heads in the mango tree, listening to everything that they were saying. 
And the longer it went on, the more angry the outcast became. He said, that's not right. Why is the king sitting on a high seat and the Brahmin is sitting on the low seat? The Brahmin is the teacher. He is the one who should be in the high seat. That's disrespect to the teacher for the king to be like that. Yes, if the king's sitting in his throne room, he gets the high seat. But here, he is learning from the Brahmin and he should have respect for his teacher and he should sit on the low seat. And as he was sitting up there, he got more and more angry about this until eventually he couldn't stop himself. He leapt out of the mango tree right in front of them. <laughs> they were so shocked. And the guards rushed forward, ready to chop his head off. And the king said, stop, stop, wait a minute. I want to find out who this person is before you kill him. And he said to the outcast, who are you? He said, and the outcast said, I am, I am ruined. I am a broken man. He said, King, you are a fool. And the Brahmin, he is a dead man. And the king's, king was so shocked by this, to have someone speaking to him like this. He said, what, what can you mean by that? And he, said, he explained to him, you were, the, you were here, you were supposed to be the one who's upholding the rules and the laws of society. You're supposed to be the one who's the guardian of what's right in the realm. And yet you were sitting on the high seat and not showing respect for the teacher. You expect us to show respect for your laws, but you don't show respect for the rules of good propriety. <laughs> and when he said that, the king was full of shame. He said, you're right. Thank you for telling me that. Obviously, you are a man of wisdom and discernment said to the guards, don't kill him. And the king said to the outcast, he said, what, what caste do you come from? You know, you're obviously a man of intelligence. What caste do you come from? He said, I'm an outcast. And the king said, well, if you had come from one of the high castes, I would have abdicated the throne and appointed you in my stead because you obviously know much more wisdom about ruling the realm than I do. However, it's not appropriate to do that with an outcast. So what I will do is create a special post for you. I will appoint you the king of the night. And you can rule the realm in the night time, and I will rule the realm in the daytime. And so the outcast went home to his wife. My darling, did you bring me a mango? <laughs> My dear, you can eat mangoes <laughs> any day of the year. Come, we're going to live in the royal palace. So this is the story of the outcast who became the king of the night. Now this story that I've just told is taken from the Buddhist Jataka tales. And it's one of more than 500 stories in the Buddhist Jataka tales that we preserve in the Pali collection. There are hundreds more in, in Chinese and Sanskrit and Tibetan. One of the reasons that I love that particular story and that, that genre of story is because it encapsulates a range of very deep and very interesting mythic motifs. And I'm just going to note a few of these in passing before going on. Okay, so a few things to see here. One thing is to see the relationship between the man and the woman. Right? They're in partnership, but they have distinct roles. Her role is to want, and his role is to do. Yeah? And that particular wanting, that yearning that she has, has a word in Indic uh, tales. That word is dohala or dohada. And that dohala or dohada has a few different spellings, is a common motif of mythology and, and folk tales and uh, uh, customs in India and the Indic region. And the nature of the dohala is that it's, a, it's the desire or the yearning that a woman has that is unstoppable, that can't be explained, it's irrational, 
and it changes the world. And I'm going to be coming back to this theme. Actually, a number of years ago, I was in America uh, doing a conference and I was uh, speaking to some of the other teachers on the conference and the topic of this tale came up and I d briefly described this tale and the cu young couple at the table just laughed. And she, she said, oh, you won't believe this. But the husband said, I spent the whole of yesterday running around L.A. looking for a mango for my, pre for my pregnant wife. <laughs> So these things are rooted in some kind of reality, but they take on a significance because of the way the story is told. I'm just going to briefly mention a few of these motifs. And notice the other motifs here is, is transgression. right? So the outcast is outside of the system, and he breaks into the system, and he, he reforms the system. Right? He, he uses his outcast status to turn everything upside down. Right? So you consider the vertical space here. Right? The, the, the Brahman is on the ground because the Brahman should be on the highest level in Indian hierarchy. Right? The Brahman's on the ground and then the king and then the outcast. Everything's upside down. So he turns the world upside down. Yeah? And through that, he's appointed king of the night. I mean, what, a, what an incredibly evocative title that is. Right? So the king is the one who rules the realm of work, and jobs, and highways, and ec economics. And the outcast is the one who rules everything that happens at night. Dreams, and love, and forgetting. Yeah. Perhaps that's what we need in our society. We could have a prime minister of the night. He could look after all of our unspoken desires. I don't know. But that idea that, that, that through coming, coming from that seemingly small, irrational desire of that woman came a transformation in society that accepted and expanded what, what the possibilities were, expanded ultimately consciousness. And even though that's a very small tale, it includes these very profound motifs. Now, one of the characteristics of mythology is that the same stories keep getting told again and again and again from slightly different perspectives. And at the moment, I'm just throwing things out at you. I don't expect you to necessarily believe everything I'm saying or accept it, right? but just try to try to sort of feel your way into it a little bit to get a sense for how these stories are working. Now, we're going to be doing a four-week course. This is all just an experiment as far as I'm concerned. I've never taught this course before, and in fact, I've never taught mythology in this way before. So hopefully it will work, and it may well change as we go along. But this is how I'm conceiving it at the moment. To this evening, we'll be doing an introduction to mythology. And I'll try to give you a sense of what mythology is about from my perspective. Next week, we'll talk some more about the petite myths, specifically focusing on Jataka stories. Third week, we'll talk more about grand myth and maybe the life of the Buddha, although I'm not sure if we'll actually make it that far, depending on how much space and time we've got. And then finally, the fourth week will be about creative mythology. That is to say, how we respond here and now to mythology and what we make of it. Now, <coughs> just so that we're clear, I don't have any qualifications. <laughs> I've never done any course, you know, university studies on mythology or anything like that. I just have an interest in it. And I've had an interest since I was a young man. And like many people of my generation, brought up on the Lord of the Rings. And of course, a very profound mythology. You know, Lord of the Rings, of course, is the, the foundation really of modern creative mythology. Even something like Star Wars, right? classic mythic text and uh, as is well known, was inspired by Joseph Campbell's he hero journey. 
But my interest in myth studying mythology it's itself came in a serious way, came later, after I'd been exposed to Buddhism. And I'll just tell you very, very briefly the background of that story so you have some kind of understanding of where I'm coming from and why particular things interest me. Partly it's just because, you know, it, it's an interesting field. But one of the things that had happened to me in studying Buddhism, uh, first thing is that, you know, for myself, my own personality, I tend to be quite a, a, a kind of a, a rationalist person, quite an intellectual person. And I, I like things to make sense. And so I kind of like philosophy and I like science and I like finding footnotes for things and uh, that kind of stuff. And when I encountered Buddhism, one of the things that I found was that was quite revelatory for me was that there was something which was beyond rationality. Right? And that's the peace of meditation and the freedom of meditation. This lies beyond rationality. And that was that was an incredible revelation and that, you know, changed my life. As I went on with my practice of Buddhism, then certain things start to happen where you begin to sort of think, oh, what's going on with that? Like, people start behaving in certain ways or having certain beliefs or certain ideas. Uh, and, you know, we all know that there's a lot of superstitious practices in Buddhism, a lot of, like, amulets and black magic and all of these kinds of things. I was living in Thailand, so it's full of those kinds of things. But it's not just that that I'm talking about. That's included. It's not just that, though. One of the things that, was with that, that really kind of I learned over time, and at, at a lot of pain and suffering for myself, actually, was just to, to uncover the level of irrationality uh, in my friends and people around me and in the culture and so on, especially when it came to the topic of women, and especially when we, we began talking about bhikkhuni ordination. And it was really very simple. When I was a young monk, everyone said you can't have bhikkhuni ordination because it's not legally valid. It seems like a very rational reason. Okay. Time went on. I studied the Vinaya. I learned about things. And then, like almost every other scholar who's looked into it, I concluded that the arguments to say that bhikkhuni ordination is not legally valid are fallacious. It's not true. I thought this was a very interesting finding. I thought, oh, I'll explain this to people. You know, show them the evidence, show them the argument, and then people will say, oh, no, actually, it's fine. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> right? Not to say that it didn't happen with everyone. Some people it did, yes. Yeah, and people changed their minds. I changed my mind. My teacher, Arjun Brahm, changed his mind, and other people changed their mind. But a lot of people didn't. And, and one of the things that I encountered was this very strange, heated, emotional response, like this kind of explosion of all these kind of subterranean energies. And I'd never really suspected this. I'd never had any idea what was going on here. And so this is what really drove me to start looking at, to realize actually what's happening here is something irrational, something which lies underneath and beneath our rationality, shapes out the way that we think. And I intuited and I started to look into this and I, start, I realized that the irrational is very often preserved in Buddhism in the mythology. And so the mythology retains all kinds of things that the explicit doctrines have said, no, no, this is not appropriate, we don't want this. And so we can learn a lot about things from the mythology that we're not going to learn from other sources in Buddhism. So this is really one of the reasons why I'm going to be doing this. This is my own personal journey. And it's, it's not just that. You know, there was a reason why when that happened that I looked into mythology. I was already interested and I'd already read quite a lot on it. So it was already a topic of interest, but it became much more personal and much more meaningful for me at that stage. That's my personal journey. And obviously you have your own personal journeys and it's not going to mean the same thing to you. But I'm just I'm trying to convey to you something of the sense that this isn't just a, a topic of study to just look at some stories and see what they mean. But it's something that really kind of affects people. And something I think it's something that really matters. Okay. So what I'm going to do in this initial introduction is I'm going to give you a very personal uh, perspective on what mythology is and what it means. Mythology is a huge topic. 
there are many different fields of study and disciplines and so on that are involved in them, none of which I'm an expert at. But I have read quite widely in the field. And over reading for a long time and contemplating and so on for a long time, uh, I came to what I think are some insights that are interesting and useful for me. And this is what I'm going to try to share with you. If anybody's interested to look in more detail, there's a book, White Bones, Red Rot, Black Snakes. And it's a nice thick book with like lots of footnotes in it. <laughs> uh, available on lulu.com. If you want to read it, you can order a copy from there. Okay, so here is some background information on what mythology is. Okay? A myth is a sacred story. A myth is told by a people, not by a person. What that means is that mythology is not fiction. Right? Modern fiction is a person telling about their own experiences, their inner world, their life or you know, imagining someone else's life. A myth is something which is passed down by people and goes through many hands and gradually morphs and changes as it does so. And it becomes something that's kind of worn. right? A mythic object is a worn object. And like the, the personal details get rubbed off it. Yeah? And only, the, only the, the, the primary shape remains. And so this is, for this, this is why a myth is an expression, a creative expression of a people. Yeah? And it's the story that people tell to say what kind of people they are. Yeah? It's, it's, it's a story that establishes identity. So a myth is never heard for the first time. right? There's no such thing as spoilers with myths. Right? Think about it. Think about your own upbringing. When was the first t time you heard about Jesus in the manger? Right? You, you never heard about it the first time. It's just there. It's part of your culture. And it's just in your life. And it's always been there. Myth is the script for ritual. Okay, so what I mean by that is that when we perform uh, rituals, we are enacting certain myths, and uh, we are reproducing events from different mythologies and so on. I mean, even think of a, a very si very simple example would be, say, if we bow to a Buddha image. Right in the story of the Buddha, it mentions that when people go to see the Buddha, that they will bow to a Buddha, bow to him. Right? This is kind of program. We're told this is the behavior. And because that's the script, that's what we do. Right? And there, of course, are many more complex examples. Again, if those of you have been brought up in a, in a Christian background will be familiar with the, like the, the, the rites of the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the testament and taking the bread and these kinds of things, repeating the events of the Last Supper as told in the Bible. So there's an interplay between mythology and ritual, that is to say, between words and deeds. Right? Words and deeds. And so in that way, uh, mythology also encompasses things like dance and song and theatre. Right? When I say encompasses all of those things, it's perhaps better to say it's the womb for all of those things. It's the place where all of those things come from. Before we thought of these as specialized secular disciplines that are separate from each other, they're all part of participating in a sacred story. So because it's, because it's involved with ritual, it's not just something that you hear about. It's not just something that you're, that's objectified. It's something you take part in. We even still do that today with the kids. Like We, we were just at a, 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 a Vesak event um, a few days ago with the, the local... Indian Ambedkar community, and they were doing a, like a story for the life of the Buddha, and they they dress the kids up in the different costumes and so on. So they're actually acting out those things. 
So myth is the scriptural ritual. There's a, there's a relationship between the story and the ritual, and that can be a complex relationship. Sometimes the myth comes first, and the ritual stems from that, but commonly it happens the other way around. There'll be a certain ritual which is passed down, nobody really knows where it's from, and then a story is invented to make sense of the ritual. Yeah? And so there's a complex interrelation between these things. Myth is the womb of meaning. Yeah? What do I mean by that? I mean, I mean that it's, it, it, it stems from a very old and very primal uh, dimension of human culture, which gives rise to all other kinds of knowledge. And if we look into mythology, we can see you know, psychology and anthropology and history, and we can see politics, and we can see all of these kinds of things. We can see you know, drama and fiction. We can see uh, abseiling. The Chadanta Jataka in the in the uh, one of the Jataka stories has the the earliest description of abseiling techniques, right? Very detailed, right? A, a you, about how to put the pinion in, how to hang the rope around, climbing up, pulling the pinion out, climbing up again, and so on, right? All the details of how he's packed up his backpack and going climbing and things like that. So all of these different aspects, because it's story, right? It's story, and because it's story, it contains all kinds, all aspects of human nature. Right? And what it does, because it's sacred story, it places all those aspects of human nature within the divine, within some kind of relationship of meaning with the world. And this is something that we experienced. As some of us were uh, in Central Australia, uh, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, and we ex we experienced that in quite a profound way. I think there, when when the the local community members were explaining their stories to us, and we could see that this this is this is their life. These, these words and these stories is not just a, a, not just something that you read. It's, it's where you get water from. It's where the ancestors lived. It's where life happens. It's how the world began. It's everything that's around you. And your story is making sense and giving a meaning to that world that you're living in. Right. Which then brings us to the next one. Myth is not understood. It's apprehended. What I mean by that is to say that when if 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 we think about understanding something, understanding in a sense has a has an underline, right? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, I understand. It means you don't have to keep talking, right? Whereas myth is something that you engage in. It's something that you keep on learning from. Yeah? And again, think about how myth and ritual are used within religious communities. It's not like you know, if you're a Christian, you don't say, well, I've, you know, I've done mass. I've had that bread stuff, okay, I don't need to do that again, right? <laughs> right? You do it every week. And if you're a Buddhist, the same thing. You do your chanting and you do the bowing and those kinds of things. It's part of your life. It's part of who you are. And it creates an impression that goes beyond or goes underneath, I think, underneath a kind of rational explanation. It, it impacts our minds in ways that, and shapes our minds in ways that we don't expect. Okay, so I've been talking for a little while now. Let's have a few minutes of meditation as a bit of a break.
Okay, let's continue. Myth may not be reduced to facts or morality. It is not history or psychology or spirituality. It is story. It contains multitudes. And one thing to uh, bear in mind when reading myth is that morality is not, is not kind of the point of mythology. A lot of stories will tell a moral, right? They have a, a moral, this is right and this is wrong and so on. But the, the real purpose of mythology is not about right and wrong. That's something which is kind of an emergent thing in mythology. The real purpose of mythology is about life. It's about existence. It's about the fact that we are here. The reason why I'm mentioning these things is I'm trying to encourage you to deconstruct and deprogram the way that you look at stories. If you look at stories always, you know, like a Buddhist story, always looking what's the moral of the story or these kinds of things, you're, you're in a sense, you're, you're reading your presuppositions into the story. I'm trying to awaken a curiosity to look at something that's a bit more obscure, a bit more subtle, something that lies a little bit under the surface. And mythology is really about a sense of wonder as to what, what, what is in the world and what it contains. There's a wonderful image from India of this elephant containing multitudes, all the stories of the world all within that one elephant. It's gone. That's the slide, no? What's happened here? Did I do that? <laughs> Are we good, no? There we go. Beautiful. Thank you, Sarah Trumpel. There we go. Now you know what I'm talking about. Now I don't sound like a complete nutter. Hopefully. So there's no one <coughs> right way to read mythology. Personally, I've, I've read most of the main mythological theorists and so on, and you know I've, I've learned something from, from all of them. Uh, there's the, the myth and ritual school, which is one of the older schools of mythology, which, as, as I, I noted before, uh, is mainly concerned with looking at the relationship between mythology and ritual. There's uh, anthropological ways of looking at mythology, so you relate stories to how people are actually living in their environment. And that anthropological study of mythology is, is quite useful because it will help you to... You, you can find out things, for example, uh, like, say, why certain... Uh, foods might be allowed, right? So in, in certain region that might say, you know, you can't eat pigs and there might be a story that says why pigs are sinful and you can't eat them. But then if you look at it from an anthropological point of view, then you might see, well, there's actually a valid sort of environmental or economic reason why pigs had become something which was a taboo animal. So you see kind of the relationship between the life that people lived and the stories that they're telling about those lives. Of course, uh, one of the most famous uses of uh, mythology in modern times is, is as psychology uh, and pioneered by uh, Sigmund Freud, especially with his Oedipal myth, uh, and uh, later uh, developed by Carl Jung and others. Um, that mythology tells of psychological truths is hardly surprising. Obviously, stories come from the human mind. Of course, they're going to tell you something about the human mind. And because they pass down through many hands, they tell us something general about the human mind. They don't just tell us something specifically about this mind in this place at this time. They tell us something that has meaning for many people over many times. 
And this, of course, was one of the main ideas that informed um, uh, Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. Sorry, I should come back again, talk to the myth and ritual school uh, uh, associated sometimes with James Fraser. And one of the ideas that emerged from that and looking at, at mythology was the universal character of mythology around the world. It's a somewhat controversial topic. I mean, all of these are controversial, but just that idea that there are shared elements and aspects of stories in cultures all around the world. And this is something which is an overwhelming uh, reality of myth and ritual uh, and something which demands an explanation. One of the things that got me interested in this study originally was the problem of the sacrifice. Right? And the word sacrifice literally means to make sacred. And we have this thing in human culture where people like just ritually destroy stuff. As, and that's, that's the, the heart of the religious observance, like all around the world. Anything from a bit of rice to a human being is killed in the sacrifice. What's up with that? Why? Why did so many people in so many different places all around the world think that sacrifice was a good idea? Right? The more you start to think about it, you realize it's very, very weird. Right? <laughs> So this is why some of the problems that, be, that, that, that start to impress themselves upon the mind when looking at this. And of course, there are many different solutions to this, many different ways of looking at it. Another way, another important approach to mythology is a structuralist approach uh, uh, developed by Claude uh, Levi-Strauss. And structuralism is a very uh, interesting uh, approach and it, it, um, it was a movement on from early approaches which tended to dismiss myth and ritual as irrational. And uh, Levi-Strauss looked at a certain kind of logic and a certain kind of truth which was, being emer which was emerging from mythology and stories. Now, here's a very subtle and complex um, uh, writer, but one of his basic ideas was that he would set up these dichotomies, uh, the sacred and the profane is one I used for this uh, series of talks, the raw and the cooked is another one. Uh, and there are many. And it's talking about this idea that you set up the world where are these kind of binary differences, you know, men and women, right? night and day, right? all of those things. But of course the problem is that they're never really binary. Yeah? And if you use the logical categories, you say either or, and you divide the world up into either or, but the world isn't really like that. How do you resolve those differences? Logic is very struggles to resolve those diff differences. But how you resolve those differences in mythology is by telling a story about it. And every time you tell the story, it's a little bit different. Yeah? This is like a really important feature of mythological of myth, myth and how they set up their own inner logic. Okay? I'll give you one example of that, a structuralist idea within Buddhist myth, which is incredibly important, and that's the moment of renunciation. The moment when the Buddha, or the Siddhartha in those days, or anybody else chooses to leave their family and go forth. I mean, it's terrible, right? It's a terrible choice to have to make. Right? How do you decide that? Do I stay with my family and look after my family? I mean, every value that we have tells us, yes, of course you have to. That's the right thing to do. Of course it is. And yet, he chooses the other thing. Yeah? And that's not... Why? Why does he choose that? Because he's aspiring to a higher set of values, a new kind of morality. Right? And you can't resolve that tension. And every time that that story is told, it's told differently. And the way that the stories will play with that tension, explaining that event in different ways. No one's ever satisfied. It's really remarkable. You look, every single version of the Buddha's life story that you look will explain that event in a slightly different way. No one's ever satisfied. It keeps niggling at your mind, right? And I have to look at it a different way. In the Jataka stories, that same event happens dozens, maybe hundreds of times. People decide to go forth, men go forth, women go forth, and every time it's different. Right? Sometimes the husband and wife go forth together. Sometimes the wife goes off and leaves the husband behind. Sometimes they go forth with the whole household. Sometimes the whole kingdom goes forth, and they all go up into the mountains and meditate together. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
I'm not quite sure how much sense it makes. You might as well stay where you are. But anyway, and so there's, and every time that tension has to be resolved slightly differently. And that's, that's that idea that Levi Strauss was talking about with structuralism. There isn't a, a right or wrong, but you tell a story about it. And that story lets you cope with it, it lets you deal with it. So all of these different ways of reading mythology and, and many more. So there's no one right way. But the fact that there's no one right way doesn't mean that there's no wrong way. And I think that there are, there are certain ways of looking at mythology which are misleading and not very useful. And so here's a couple of fallacies which you may well be familiar with. Fallacy number one is materialistic reduction. Myth is incorrect. It is bad history. Okay, so this is the kind of the normal thing that people say. The other day, uh, we, I said something came up, we were teaching mythology, and someone said, but how can Buddhism have a mythology? Right? Myth means things that aren't true, and everything in Buddhism is true. Right? No, no. In, when studying mythology, the word myth has nothing to do with truth. Okay, so this is not like Mythbusters, right? So in Mythbusters, if it's a myth, means it's false. That's got nothing to do with the meaning of myth when we're studying mythology, right? So materialists would tend to, and reductionists would say, uh, you know, these stories aren't true, they didn't happen, you know, you can look, they've got devas in them, they've got miracles in them, they've got all these things happening in them, that those things don't, aren't real, none of those things happen, therefore we can dismiss the whole lot of them. Right? There's no such thing as talking animals, so let's just get rid of the whole Jataka collection. Right? And this is where you get that refusal to listen to those other dimensions of the mind. Right? As soon as you just, you've done that, then you, you're, you're, what's, the question is, why do these stories mean something to someone? And then the only answer that you have to that is, well, because they were stu superstitious and primitive and stupid, and I'm more intelligent than they are. Right? And that's the default position of the materialist thing, just to dismiss it and ignore it. It's bad history. And in the early, early in the study of mythology in the West, this was a kind of default position. People like James Fraser and so on, they believed that scientific rationalism was a, a superior uh, way of looking at the world and that looking at it from, from the point of view of mythology was superstitious and so on. The second way of looking at it is through spiritual elevation, which is like a sort of the, the other side. Myth is correct. Right? It is coded transcendence. And so this is what you get a lot from, say, Jungian schools uh, and other sort of spiritual New Age schools these days. And they're kind of looking for some kind of profound, kind of elevated meaning through goddess worship and these kinds of things. And one of the problems with those things is that, that, that there's a lot in myth which is very troubling. I mean, if you want to do goddess worship, great. Love it. I think it's fantastic, you know. But, like, goddesses, they, people used to do a lot of human sacrifice for goddesses back in the day, right? Like, a lot. Like, seriously, a lot. <laughs> so is that going to be part of your kind of modern goddess worship thing? <laughs> and it's more complicated than that is the point that I'm saying. Right? So I'm not saying that you shouldn't do these things. I'm saying that when we look at it as mythology, it's more complicated than that. So we shouldn't be looking at mythology as being something that's true or untrue. Right? Would we debate whether a tree is correct? It just is. Mythology is life. It's how we live. It's not right or wrong. But if we listen to it, and if we bring a sense of wonder sense of wonder, a sense of play, a sense of humor to it, we can start to listen to it because it tells us about humanity. And human, human beings are not sensible creatures. I don't know if you noticed. Myth does not set out to be about something. It evolves organically, springing from a sense of wonder and growing into its own meaning. Yeah. So... These days, if we, again, if we think about how I tell a story these days, generally you have an idea, I want to tell this particular story and I have an idea why I do it, I'm telling a story about this. And myths get that way, right? When the mythology that we've received, it, it becomes like that, a myth is about something. But it doesn't begin like that. It begins as a, as a tale. 
it begins as just something someone said, an event, and then one event's connected with another, and then it gets told and it gets retold, and it forms and gets shaped and gets influenced. And the meaning gradually and organically evolves out of it. And so it's always messy, and it's always incomplete, and it always has many possibilities. And it grows into its own meaning. It finds out what it's about at the end of the story, maybe, or maybe a long time afterwards. Again, this idea that, that myth is not conscious, it's coming from the unconscious. Okay, so I'm conscious of the time, wondering how we should break this up. Let's, let's have a bit of a break now. Let's have a 10 minute break, give you time for have to stretch your legs, have a cup of tea, and then we'll come back again. It's a spoiler. Okay, so. Uh, let's begin the second part of it, and I just want to just give some more perspective on mythology, and particularly I want to give some idea of, of from my point of view, and again, I just want to really stress this is my personal point of view, and I, I don't want to, certainly don't want to say it's the only point of view, but it's a point of view that helps me and makes sense for me, of, of how we look and look at myth and look at the things that, that matter for me in what myth is about and things that we're going to be looking at later on. Okay, so I'm going to begin here with looking at the five aggregates, pancha kandaha. And I'm sure most of you have heard of the five aggregates, right? Is that correct? Most of you, if you've been around Buddhism for a little while, you would have heard of the five aggregates, one of the main teaching topics in Buddhism, and form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. Okay, so these this is a very sort of classical Buddhist sort of set of categories. As you can see, it's a very kind of rational set of categories. And it represents essentially those things which we tend to attach to as our self. And so the Buddha uh, would raise all of these things up in meditation and say we investigate them, we see them as impermanent, and then we uh, let go of them. Now, when we're talking about these things, we normally consider them to be... Um, they're normally considered as like a, a set of different phenomena or different aspects of uh, our person, our, our mind and body. Uh, but when we look at it, there's actually quite a subtle internal structure to them. Uh, and there's a sort of development, a movement from something which is more basic towards something which is more refined and more subtle. Uh, and form is the basis. Uh, dealing with matter, energy, physical structure. And as a person, then, as a human being, then we satisfy the needs of the, that, that physical realm through food, things like food, safety, and shelter, and so on. And so you might begin to recognize that this sort of set of things and this kind of ascending pyramid, it's a little bit similar to things like um, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs and these kinds of models which you develop in psychology. And in fact, that's where I got the idea of looking at the aggregates in this way. Uh, I, I don't want to go too much into this. I don't you know, want to spend a lot of time with this model. But the, the point of giving you this model is to, is to be able to situate mythology within it and to be able to suggest that there's a particular role for mythology which has a sort of a, a part to play here. So feeling uh, is is uh, characteristic of the animal realm, especially uh, and things like basic emotional fear, fight, flight, hunger, and so on, coping, uh, ple pleasure seeking, uh, and so on. Uh, and in terms of child development, uh, then things like coping and delayed gratification, and so on. And then we come to the level of perception. Now, perception is associated with things like memory, recognition, and culture. Uh, it, it's through perception that we can uh, develop a common store of ideas which we can then pass down through language and story. All right? uh, so perception is developed uh, through the child as the child learns language, it learns to identify objects, it learns to identify individuals. And it's expressed in a culture uh, through things like mythology, ritual and creative activity. But there's a number of really important things that's going on with the realm of perception. One thing that's going on is that the, whole, the role of perception is to unify things. Perception takes a diverse range of experience and presents it as one thing. It creates like an idea of a whole in your mind. So for example, and this is the idea that they call in, in psychology, they call object permanence. 
Right? So for, a, for, a, for an infant, if the mother is present and then the mother leaves, they don't know that the mother exists. And then the mother comes back and then the mother's existing again. Right? But later on, as a child, the infant develops their perception, they develop this idea that the, the mother still exists, even though she's not actually present. You can't see her. Right? So this, is, this idea of the mother is present in the mind of the infant, even though the mother herself is not there. And that's a, something which has to be learned. Right? It's not just something that's automatic. It's something that has to be learned. And that same or similar uh, faculty is then taken up and consciously used in culture to create similar things. For example, how do we remember the fallen of our past battles? Right? You create a monument to them. You have a ritual for them. You go there and have an Anzac Day ceremony. And that ritual enables you to realize the, the sacrifice that was made or whatever it is that you're, memory, you know, that you're trying to remember. And for indigenous peoples, it's, it's much more... Um, <clears throat> much more urgent. You have to remember where the water is. You have to remember uh, when's the right time to go to that particular mountain where those particular yams are going to be in season. Right? So, so all of those details are coded into the mythology and they're all passed down as the wisdom or the Veda of the, uh, of the community. So that's the realm of perception. Now, that's that, and that realm of perception, I think, is is dominant of most human cultures most of the time. And a few human cultures, probably relatively recently, uh, by recently I mean two or three thousand years, have focused on the aspect of what we call sankharas or choices, which is the realm of intention, rationality, morality developing sciences and philosophies and applications of that in technology and so on and so forth. And this is what we recognize as the, the great or the higher civilizations in the world. Then there is consciousness, awareness and knowing, which is developed through meditation and higher spirituality. And the, the recognition and development of that in a deliberate way is very characteristic, especially uh, of the Indian, um, the higher Indian spiritual paths, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism, uh, and may have developed in other places, but it certainly is very characteristic of that that uh, area. So the little diagram there sort of sort of indicates, you know, most of the world actually is matter. So the bottom of the pyramid is matter, and that's really big. Yeah, and as you go up higher in the pyramid, there's a lot less of it. There's not many. There's a lot of people in the world who uh, uh, tonight are out there trying to get food. <laughs> there's not a lot of people who are doing meditation. Yeah, it's just the reality of it. So this is just again. I, I don't want to go too much into this or to discuss the ramifications of this model too much, but just to sort of recognise that perception is somewhat falling in the middle here, and that mostly when we talk about Buddhism, we talk about these two things. Right? We either talk about Buddhism as a philosophy and we discuss the morality of Buddhism, the ethics of it, we treat it as something that's rational right? and something we can figure out is this the right way of doing things and wrong way of doing things and so on, or we discuss it in terms of consciousness, right? awareness, meditation and so on and so forth. Actually, transcendence and Nibbana is, of course, beyond all of those things. Right? But this is where we, where we usually discuss it in those two kinds of domains. And so one of the points that I'm trying to make with bringing attention to mythology is the recognition that within Buddhist cultures, as within all cultures at all times, there is in fact a very rich uh, body of work and a lot of effort and a lot of creativity and a lot of uh, imagination and tireless effort has gone into creating and sustaining a mythology for thousands of years. And I think it's a very it's a very curious thing that this is almost entirely um, disregarded in modern times. Either uh, the mo modern Buddhism has almost completely dismissed that realm of mythology. It's just regarded as a kind of a, a quaint um, cultural hangover, and not of anything that has any meaning or that's deserving of any serious study.
a, a few years ago, I was um, whinging to some of my friends about how there wasn't even a Buddhist uh, mythology article on Wikipedia. And uh, shocking, actually. I mean, I find it incomprehensible. And there's an article, there was some kind of article, but it hardly said anything. And so after years of whinging and complaining, I eventually wrote one. And so now there is an article on Buddhist mythology in Wikipedia. And a couple of other people did a lot of work on it, but I wrote, wrote them first draft. But it's really neglected, and like within the field of Buddhist studies and these kinds of things, you hardly see anything on mythology. So almost all the study and research that I did, you know, when I work with, in the Buddhist sphere, I work with the, the basic texts and the, the fundamental resources, but all of my learning about mythology came from outside of this, the field of Buddhism. Okay, now, and I should maybe, maybe just remark that um, the, the lack of study and lack of interest in the study of mythology in Buddhism uh, is despite the fact that the most significant book on mythology probably ever written was Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, which holds a good uh, stab at being the most influential book of all time, certainly in the top ten. Uh, and he outlined the uh, hero myth and used the story of the Buddha as one of the prime examples of that hero myth. So even though it was at such a prominent sp spot in, and acknowledged so deeply in that powerful text, uh, still it's had minimal impact, as far as I can tell, on Buddhists to actually recognize the, the value and the meaning of their own mythology. Okay. Now this is something which uh, is going to be uh, a bit controversial and please feel happy to, to reject this idea. But if we look at this, this, this scale, kind of ascending scale if you like, uh, you may have heard of the historical concept they call the Axial Age. Are people familiar with the Axial Age idea? Yes? No? A few people are, a few people aren't? Okay. So it's a concept developed in history which points out the fact that most of the um, great uh, cultural uh, civilizations that we know in history uh, centered around 500 BC. And so that includes in India the Jains, the Buddhists, and the um, Upanishads, the great uh, uh, Brahmanical scriptures, as well as the, the realm of Ashoka. In China, Lao Tzu and Confucius were around the same time. In uh, the Middle East, uh, various things, but including the major books of the Old Testament were put together around that time. Uh, and of course, in Greece, the great uh, philosophers, um, Socrates, Plato, Archimedes, Aristotle, and so on, all lived around that time. Uh, and others as well, like, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Akhenaten, 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 I think, in Egypt, the reforming, reforming pharaoh, and various other things. So there was a, a, somehow a shift where culture went from that mythological stage to a developing science and developing philosophy and developing all these kinds of rational arts, developing mathematics. Not to say that those things didn't exist before, but there certainly seems to have been some major shift. What the reasons for that, I don't know. And I'm not going to postulate too much. I'm simply going to observe the fact that there seems to be that shift. And the old myth that we have stems from before that time. The young myth that we have comes after that time. And most myth, of course, comes after. But there are significant bodies of mythology that come from before that time. And, I, and to my view, that older mythology is more... I don't like to use the word authentic. It's not more authentic. It's more raw. It's more, there's something real about it. There's something, there's something unconscious about it, which, is, which I think is important. The younger myth is more manufactured, right? The younger myth starts with the life of the Buddha. It's a conscious myth where they're deliberately using the mythic stories and tropes and archetypes to create a story, right? And it ends with whatever Avengers movie was playing down the road, right? Right? That's the creation of that that younger myth. The old myth includes things like uh, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, 
uh, some of the older stories in the Bible, uh, pyramid texts in Egypt, uh, some of the ancient Babylonian uh, cuneiform inscriptions, especially the reconstructed Epic of Gilgamesh, um, the Vedic uh, texts, and maybe maybe some things from China. I'm not sure. Not too much from China in that time. In terms of mythology, probably some stories and things, but not, I'm not sure if there's a developed mythological corpus. Uh, and in, indigenous ones, it's hard to say, right? So indigenous stories, so, so that's, they're the ones that anyway we know are sourced before that time. And then you get stories which come later, but which have roots in that time, among which would be, so, say, the Jataka stories. Right? So the Jataka stories was recognized by Thomas or Carolyn Rees Davis, I can't remember which one now. I think Thomas Rees David said the Jataka stories is the largest, the oldest, and the best preserved collection of uh, uh, storytelling or folk tales anywhere in the world. Uh, and because the Jataka stories are roughly 2,000 years old or more, they are very old, much older than things like, say, the Grimm's fairy tales and so on, which are much more recent collections. Things like indigenous mythologies and so on, of course, have roots in very ancient times and may well and, and certainly do preserve memories of very ancient things but mythology of course is a living tradition so it's 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 difficult to ascertain how much of it goes back to that early time and how much but certainly there's there's elements of those older myth in uh, indigenous mythology as well if anyone wants to learn some more about that i'm doing uh, the sakudita i'm telling doing using an indigenous creation myth for sakudita uh, Okay, so why am I making this distinction? What's important about it? Maybe nothing. Maybe nothing. It's interesting to me. There's something about it that that the, the, the mythologies that we have are coming from the end of that era, the end of that time. Right? They kind of preserved somehow through some kind of accidents, a few fragments of culture, a few fragments of ideas and things like that. And they speak to something which is less, less knowable, less obvious. When we look at those very old myths, there's always things that are very weird about them. They're not kind of normalized. And so they, they, they tell us something about our humanity which maybe we, we didn't know about. When we see the the the, the new the younger myths, they're more glossy, they're more structured, right? They're more put together. Not to say that one's better or worse, but I personally I find the older myths more interesting. So here's another controversial uh, uh, postulate: all myth has one theme, the murder of God at the hand of man. Yeah. The mood, but there are two different moods. One story, but two different moods. The mood of old myth is celebration. The mood of young myth is nostalgia. Yeah. So old myth is like, yay, we got rid of God. Now we can live. Now we can be free. Young myth is like, oh, remember those days? Yeah, I mean, the, the Lord of the Rings is a classic, great example of that. Yeah, it's infused with this kind of nostalgic longing for some kind of divinity or connection with the divine, which has been lost. Yeah? Old myth, like this, celebratory, right? something like the Vedas. Yeah, joyous, bright, vivacious, full of life. So why do I say that this myth has the, the theme of the murder of God? So there's a there's a, an inscription I can't I think it's Hercules killing off someone. I can't I, I've forgotten the story actually, that particular story. But we find this idea of the murder of God. I mean, think of something like say the Bible is a good example, right? So if we look at the Bible on 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 one level, the Bible is like the story of God and His message to the world. Okay, that's fine. On one level, that's why I've taken it. But if you look look at the point of view of the Bible, the beginning of the Bible is the God, and he's like, let there be light, and he's just there by himself. Then he creates Adam and Eve. And then he's like, okay, so now there's three characters, right? 
Then he kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden. But the story follows Adam and Eve. It doesn't follow God. And God keeps on receding further and further into the background. It doesn't take long in the Bible, the Old Testament, before, uh, I can't remember which one it was, Abraham maybe, was told you can't look God in the face. You can only, God will walk past you and you can turn your head and get a glimpse of the divine bum as he walks past. <laughs> right? And so now all we can see is God's bum. <laughs> There's something very profound about that, right? <laughs> uh, and also in the Old Testament, you know, there's visions of God as some kind of weird, bizarre, kind of multi-headed thing, you know. And when it comes to the New Testament, God can't appear at all. He sends his son, right? God's out of it. Send your son. Then what do they do the son? Hang him up on the tree. Murder him. Yeah? So this is that paradox of mythology. We always think of mythology as being the story of the gods and the story of the sacred. But it's also the story of the ending of the sacred. It's the story of moving away from that world. And again, you can interpret this in multiple ways. You can interpret it psychologically, right? That the, the realm of the gods is the, the projection, the, the, the adult's projection of the mind as of an infant, right? And they, as they're moving away from the infant, their parents, who formerly were gods, become human. Right? That's a psychological reading of it. There are multiple ways of reading it. I'm not saying that you should have one reading of, of it or another. I'm saying this is a way of looking at it to see what kind of story are we telling here. Right? Some mythologies kill God by stripping him, stabbing him, and nailing him on a tree to die slowly. Jesus' most famous one, but there are many others. Odin was nailed upside down to Yggdrasil. Sacrifice to himself. All over the world we find this kind of motif. Buddhist mythology prefers to kill God by cracking a joke at his expense. Either way, he ends up just as dead. Once you can laugh at God, <laughs> he ain't a God anymore. Yeah? And you see this in the in the suttas, yeah, when the, when the, uh, the the, the, there's this kind of satirical uh, takes on different kinds of theology and these kinds of things. You know, cl a classic story like, I mean, just a, a simple example would be, um, uh, in say in the in the Vedas we find uh, Indra is a great war god. He's ferocious. He's he's masterly. He's a he's a he's a alpha male he man slaying dragons left, right, and center. And in the suttas, we find how does Saka win his battle? Saka is now, Indra is now evolved to become Saka or Inda in, pa in Pali. And he's in a war with the Titans and he's been defeated. They're running away and they're coming towards the forest. Their chariots driving full speed towards the forest. And then Saka says, well, Indra says, no, we can't go into the forest because the little birds have just laid their eggs. The little birdies are there in their nests and we can't hurt them. We have to turn around because we don't want to hurt the little birdies. And so Saka's charioteer turns around to not hurt the little birdies. And when the, when the demons see that, they're like, oh, they must have got reinforcements. They're coming back to attack us again. <laughs> so they get scared and run away. And that's how they win the battle. Right? So when you tell a story like that, right? God is not some forbidding power or powerful deity in the sky anymore. Right? And we find a similar thing, not just in the Buddhist tales, also in the Brahmanical literature, also in the Egyptian, in the, in the uh, uh, Greek literature, a lot of this kind of thing. Okay, I'm going to uh, mention a little bit about the golden bough here. And this is a list of uh, some of the main topics which the golden bough studies. Did anyone heard of the golden bough? No? Yes, a few people have heard. A few people, yes, no, yes, uh, yeah, yes, no. Okay. So Golden Bow is one of the most influential books of the 20th century, uh, written by Sir James Fraser, uh, in many ways uh, comparable in influence in the fields of religion and anthropology to, say, Freud in psychology or uh, Einstein in physics. Um, the Golden Bow is a massive... I have a copy of it here if you want to have a look at it. 
uh, it's widely available online. It was a massive tome put together over several decades by uh, James Fraser. He was a, a uh, Scottish uh, professor, and he would collect stories from all over the world. And he wrote to, because this was one of the first times, because the British Empire was all over the world, right? So he was writing to people. He would just find out wherever he could, find people and get them to tell stories about any customs, any rituals, any mythology, anything like that in their area. And he collected hundreds and hundreds of these stories over the years and compiled them in this multi-volume series called The Golden Bough. And The Golden Bough is built up of a liter from a literary conceit where there's a particular ritual which is mentioned in a Roman text and James Fraser says, well, how do we understand this? In order to understand it, he then surveys the entire field of human history and culture and religion and says that's how we can figure out the, uh, uh, the meaning of that particular story. Uh, one of the main themes of Fraser's work, remember that this is, he was in the same, similar generation to people like uh, Darwin, Freud, Marx, and so on, who would become some of the first prominent intellectuals who were questioning the role of Christianity in religion and culture. And Fraser uh, was pointing out that many of the things we see in modern Christian culture, speaking of his time, were in fact derived from pagan traditions. These days, I'm sure you probably all know that, you all know that Easter is an ancient fertility festival and the bunny and the egg are fertility symbols and things like that. It's because of Fraser that you know that. He was the one who went and researched and found out all of these things and put this on the map. And even though he's not so well known these days, uh, he was incredibly influential. Uh, people like Carl Jung, uh, his life was changed by Fraser. Uh, T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, uh, uh, Campbell, and so on and so forth. Uh, and he really shaped a lot of the field of uh, anthropology and so on. Now, his theories are uh, mostly rejected these days. He was a uh, uh, believed in the supremacy of his culture and believed that essentially culture moved from magic and ritual to religion and from religion to science and that science was where it was at. Right? And the purpose of him doing all of this thing was to show how silly all those fuzzy wuzzies were for doing all of these silly superstitions. I mean, he wasn't quite as bad as that, but he has some wonderful lines in there. He has one line about the, what is it, about the brutal and uncivilized savages of Africa, Australia, and Scotland. <laughs> Which, is, since he was Scottish, is perhaps not meant as literally as it might seem. Anyway. <coughs> Uh, so uh, he, he assembled all of these stories from all around the world and then arranged them according to themes and then took you basically on a trip all around the world to show you that these themes were shared in common in all of these different places. And some of the themes which are very uh, well known from Fraser, the, th the theme of the sacred king. Okay, and we remember that our story from the beginning of the outcast uh, and this is, a, this is a, a Fraserian kind of idea. The royal and priestly taboos. Right? So to look at the way that kings, uh, priests, monks, sacred people were uh, bound by taboo. And he developed a notion of taboo, which is probably quite different from what you're thinking when you think of the word taboo. When we think of the word taboo, we think of something which is wrong that you shouldn't do. Right? Is that right? Yeah? That's not what F Fraser meant by taboo at all. For Fraser, taboo was a kind of energy. Right? It's, like, it's, it's something like electricity. It's a magical version of electricity. Right? And so taboo is neither right nor wrong any more than electricity is right or wrong. Right? Taboo is a kind of power. And the reason why we have these customs and taboos is to isolate and to insulate people from that source of power because it's dangerous. Right? So anybody who's set apart like a king has certain taboos because it's dangerous to get too near them. Or someone like a monk is a very tabooed, I'm a very tabooed person. Right? So if I go to somewhere like Thailand, uh, where these taboos are still felt very much, then you can still feel that. And it, it really is. I can't emphasize how much this is. It's like a kind of um, innate electric shock. Right? I mean, I've been in different circumstances in Thailand, right? Where I was in uh, Suwanabumi Airport. And this is like one of the most modern airports in the world. And there's a row of seats, and there's like seats probably as long as that. And the seats are connected with a metal row at the back. 
and there was a lady sitting at a seat down there and I sat at the seat up there I thought that surely this is going to be okay all right <laughs> and as soon as I sat on the seat she leapt up from her seat like literally like she'd just been shocked all right this is what I mean this electric shock. it's something which is culturally internalized to such a powerful extent that it's felt as a physical force and so taboo and the, the, the practices around taboo are for isolating and protecting people from that force. No? And uh, so taboo itself is, don't, 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 from a mythological point of view, don't think of taboo itself as either good or bad. Right? It, taboo, the purpose of taboos is not to say something's bad, it's to say something's powerful. No? Morality comes later. Okay. Uh, he also talked a lot about the sacred power of trees. Uh, we have the, the Bodhi tree and so on and so forth. Uh, the, he talked about the, the ways that the spiritual and the temporal were divorced and separated from each other. Again, that idea of the sacred and the profane. The sacred power of women's fertility is one of the major themes uh, in Fraser. Uh, and, of course, all of the taboos and complexities around that, around menstruation, around childbirth, uh, and so on. And we see the way that that's handled in things like, say, the, the story of the birth of the Buddha. Uh, uh, the killing of the divine king. Right? So the ritual regicide of the divine king. Right? This is also very important. The, the, and this is, this, is, this is a reflection. All of these things are reflections of genuine anthropological facts. There are records of uh, times when the king is actually uh, uh, sacrificed or killed to make way for the next king. Right? I mean, this is how you did succession. You can't have the old king going round because, well, look what happens in Australia, right? Right? I mean, it's a lot cleaner. Right? I mean, there's something to be said for it. <laughs> the old one goes, chop off their head, move on. <laughs> I'm not saying we should bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, between heaven and earth, this idea, this is a very interesting idea, this idea of suspension, also related to the idea of taboo. Like, so very powerfully tabooed people. Uh, for example, you might find, like, say, girls who are going through their first menstruation, and they'll be isolated in the hut, and then sometimes the hut is, like, literally suspended off the earth. Right? It's again this idea of insulation. So they have to stay in a way where they're neither not to touch the sky, not to not to see the sky, not to touch the earth. And it's not when we when we hear of those things, we think, oh, well, that's bad. It's discrimination that they were made to do those things. And of course it is, but it's not just a moral thing. The kings had to do the same thing. If you look at the taboos around the Japanese emperor, for example, are, are incredibly extreme. Right? So the fact that someone's taboo doesn't mean that it's bad. It means that there's power there. And that idea of being suspended between heaven and earth is, I think, very potent in the, the Buddhist mythology. The last and most powerful of the uh, Jataka stories is the Vesantara Jataka, or not necessarily most powerful, the most famous is the Vesantara Jataka. And the word Vesantara is a very interesting one. It's explained in different ways in the Buddhist tradition. But in fact, the meaning of Vesantara, Vesa is from the, the Sanskrit Vishva, meaning all, and Antara means in between. So where santara which means in between all, right? suspended between heaven and earth. Right? Also the, this motif of when the Buddha was born, he was born on a journey, he's neither in one place nor another. And so mythology is taking us into these places where all of the, the regular ordinary realities are suspended. Again, like our outcast, right? he's in the tree, his ordinary world is suspended, all of the rules are suspended. Yeah. Uh, the external soul in plants and, and various other kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, something like the, the magic mango and various kinds of things. But this, the external soul is a very powerful motif in mythology. Many, many stories about how the life of a person can be embodied in some external object. Again, see the Lord of the Rings as a modern example of that. Um, the idea of the substitute sacrifice is extremely important and very prevalent. Those of you who, like myself, were brought up in a Christian tradition would be familiar with the story of uh, Abraham and his son. Uh, or, or if you're not brought up in a Christian tradition, if you're brought up listening to um, uh, Highway 61 Revisited, uh, you would also learn about that story as well. And 
to recap from Bob Dylan's version, God says to Abraham, kill me a son. Abe says, man, you must be putting me on. God says, no. Abe says, what? God says, you can do what you want, Abe, but the next time you see me coming, you better run. So that's Bob's, Bob Dylan's paraphrase of that story. So the idea is that God is asking Abraham to kill his son. Right? And at the last minute, it's, sac- it's substituted for a goat. Right? Now, when we see that story, we see it as something which is incomprehensible. It's, a, it's abominable. How can God be asking for a, a, a sacrifice of a child? It's, it's the most heinous thing that we can possibly imagine. Right? But from that point of view, from the point of view of early religion, that's normal. That's what you do. Jataka stories are full of tales of child sacrifice. That's what you do for all kinds of reasons. Right? To ensure fertility, to ward off disease, to ward off black magic, right? to ensure favor with the gods. There's all kinds of perfectly good reasons that you'd want to sacrifice your children. <laughs> yeah? So this is not the story about how bad it is to want to sacrifice your children. That's taken for granted. It's about the emergence of morality and about the realization that actually uh, if you do a goad, it's just as effective. Right? It works just as well, really. Phew. Yeah? And that motif of the substitute sacrifice we see all around the world. You see it in Greek mythology a lot. You see it in Indian mythology a lot. Yeah? Even that the, the story of the, the, uh, 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 the outcast, the king of the night, hidden deep within that story is many of these motifs. Yeah? The outcast is in the tree. Yeah? He's dead. He's assumed he's dead. He says he's dead. Right? He's in the tree like Jesus or like Odin and all like the other sacrifice. But actually he gets to live and then some change gets to be made. There's still a cost to be paid, but he gets to live. So this substitute sacrifice, uh, you know, where a, a human sacrifice might be replaced with an animal sacrifice, an animal sacrifice might be replaced with a, offering a rice and so on. This is what you find in Buddhist stories a lot, uh, you know, rice sacrifices instead of um, animals. Uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, the say in, in Christianity, uh, the flesh of Jesus is replaced with a, a piece of bread. Uh, and uh, when it's fully rationalized, it's not just a sacrifice anymore. It's just generosity. It's just giving. Right? Not actually sacrificing anything as such. Sorry, you had a question? Scapegoat, another one. Yeah, exactly. And scapegoats is another very important motif. Fraser talks about scapegoats a lot. And just to be clear, it's an actual goat. Right? Not always. It can be many, any different thing, but in, in di- some places it's an actual goat. And so what you do when you have a scapegoat is the whole village gets together or town gets together and you say, actually, all of the sins that we did for this last year, this goat did them all. <laughs> right? So we're going to put all of our sins on the goat and then chase him out into the desert to die. That's how we get rid of our sins. Yeah? So that's how they purify themselves for the next year. There's some lovely stories about that in the, in the Jatakas as well where... Um, uh, some of the, it was a service that some of the Brahmins would perform. Uh, so they would, because they were Brahmins, they could take it, right? The sins that people would have. So they would like have bunk beds. A Brahmin would lie underneath, and then the sinner would lie on top, and then they'd bathe the sinner and bathe their sins off them, and then the water would go down and put the sins onto the Brahmin. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So. These are and, they, and these are ways of coping with, um, uh, you know, coping with things like guilt and shame and all of those kinds of things, right? They're, 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 they're mechanisms that human cultures use for coping with things. And over time, the tendency was to move from the, the crueler or more outrageous forms of sacrifice, to introduce morality and compassion into it, and to move towards a gentler form of sacrifice. It might still be there in a symbolic form, like, say, Christianity. It might be fully rationalized, like in the Buddhist practice of dana, and so on. But there's always that movement. And it's one of the main burdens, in fact, of the uh, Greek mythology uh, also to do that. I think of uh, moments like when um, uh, Tantalus uh, offered the uh, human, you know, his son, he killed his son, offered it to the gods, right? 
and only Demeter took one bite uh, and the gods were so horrified and recoiled by this hor horrible sacrifice, which of course was the normal sacrifice. So after that, uh, human sacrifice was no longer allowed. Okay. Yes and no. Uh, the, the, the older stories, which are probably the Jatakas, and probably the Pali Jatakas include the oldest stories of all. Um, because, because they're Jatakas, I mean, I was meaning to discuss this in more details with, in the following one, but because they're Jatakas, they, they intend to tell the story of what happened before the Buddha. That's the whole point of them. And in fact, they often draw from older myths and older stories. And so the, 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 like the social, economic, historical conditions that they depict are from a, a time earlier than that of the Buddha. So that's not to say that all of the Jatakas are old in that way, but certainly some of them are. A lot, actually. Yeah, yeah. Another another excellent question. The the the, the question of um, transmission of stories is also a very complex and a very rich one. Uh, stories are told by everyone, and everyone in the culture will participate in that in some ways. One of the the stories about story is how uh, the as as after the Axial Age, when our familiar patriarchal institutions became established, government, justice systems, uh, religions, and so on, that they co-opted the stories and made them their own. So the stories that we have, he have heard are stories which have come from a broader culture and which have been co-opted by a patriarchy, in many cases. Right? No, it's not, again, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, it's just what happened. And, but much storytelling, of course, was done by women. And a lot of the roots of stories come from stories told by women, especially uh, by circles of women performing domestic work. Yeah? So sitting around sewing, sitting around preparing food, all of those kinds of jobs that women spend many, many hours doing, and they're telling stories. And a lot of uh, folk tales and fairy stories come from, from that kind of uh, background. Wonderful book um, on that by Marina Warner, uh, uh, From the Beast to the Blonde, I think it's called. From the Beast to the Blonde. She talks about that in the context of uh, European fairy, mostly European fairy tales, about how they, these stories were actually told by women and were collected by male writers who then published the books that we read them from today. Nobody said that they're myths. <laughs> oh, that's a myth to take. No. Uh, <laughs> if okay. Uh, so again, that, that's a question about the categorization, right? How do we categorize these different stories? Right? There's there's no clean way of doing that, uh, right? I mean, typically we make a difference between something like a morality tale or a fable. Uh, a, a folk story, um, and a, a mytho mythology generally is bigger and grander. It is concerned with more existential issues. It tells, to the, it has a strong element of telling about the creation of things, right? How the world was created, or how different institutions and so on were created, um, and it has a more sacred dimension, uh, typically. Uh, than uh, other folk tales and so on, but there's definitely a you know a spectrum within the Jatakas. It's it's the full spectrum of stories. Yeah. Right. Yeah an idea of the the reality of how they're actually experienced within the culture. Can I table that? because I'd like to get through the rest of the things. But I'll think about that, and maybe I'll, I'll bring that back into the subsequent uh, um, uh, subsequent uh, sessions, because it's actually quite a rich topic, and I'd, I wouldn't 
do it justice. Yeah. Are the gods mean? Mean? Ah, no, no, some of them are nice. But good question though, right? A actually, and this is one of the things that the character of a culture comes through, right? Greek myth tends to be a lot nastier. Right? A lot of the Greek myths are pretty severe, right? I mean, Oedipus is kind of a walk in the park compared to a lot of the others. I mean, Agamemnon sacrificing his daughter so that he can get a good wind for his ships. I mean, and uh, so there's a lot, the, the way that things are depicted there, um, so it, 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 to it, it, classic example of that would be the, the, this point I made here earlier. So certain mythologies, when God is killed, it's very violent, right? And so some mythologies, like the Greek mythologies, tends to be very violent in the way it depicts those things. Right? You know, you have like, uh, what's his name, the, the Kronos, who's like devouring his children, this kind of thing. You know, I mean, it's pretty primal, violent imagery, whereas in Buddhist imagery it tends to be much more gentle. You know, there's, it's a bit of a joke. There might be some kind of dark elements to it, but it's much less like that. Um, Hindu mythology is a bit difficult to characterize because it's so broad and there's so many different things. But certainly the older Hindu mythology is not violent and dark in the way that Greek mythology is. Yeah, well, there's a few things. <laughs> but, but death, within, in Hindu philosophy, in, in Hindu philosophy, death is very compassionate because death is what makes life possible. Yeah. So, and just the last detail here uh, is the, the the idea of the inversion of values, which also we saw with the the story of the the Night King and the Outcast. Right, it turns upside down all of the values. So this is just a list of some of the main themes in the Golden Vow. There's a lot of other ones, but you can see even just from this list and that little Jataka story that we heard at the beginning that there's a lot of those ideas in them. And so this is one of the ways. Just maybe to come back to, to Kate's question, this is one of the ways that I identify and I relate to stories as being mythological, is when the, there's this kind of range of themes and ideas that relate to these kind of quite primal concerns. Uh, and when these are found in the stories, then to me that, that, that's what makes it a mytholo ha having mythological interest. Uh, and we'll, we'll look a bit in some of the subsequent workshops at some contrast in this. So it's story about story. In order to create the great myths, a society... So this is something more than just telling a story around a campfire or in a sewing circle. And to create a great myth, a society requires a certain degree of development, sufficient size, trade interactions, wealth, stability, and a specialized, leisured class of literati. This is what you find you know, with people like Homer uh, in Greece. But the same factors that make this possible are also the factors that bring to a close the era of which the stories tell. Okay. Again, again, with Greek myth, the, the, the Iliad and the war with Troy and things like that, you know, on the one hand you're telling a story which is wild and with all the gods and all of those kinds of things. At the same time, you're telling the story of the establishment of an international order of trade and commerce. And as, as that order gets established, then that becomes the foundation for a society based on rules, based on legislation, and all of these kinds of things. That's myth prophesies its own redundancy. This is the birth of self-reflection, a story about its own story. Another example of this would be the, the classic story of the Ten Commandments in the Bible. Right? The Bible begins with God thundering down with what you have to do and so on. And, and the descriptions of the God in the Old Testament, you know, it's like this kind of lightning and thunder crashing across the, the wilderness as, as, you know, the patriarchs were slaughtering animals covered in blood in these tents. It's, I mean, it's pretty dramatic stuff. Right? Then he hands down the Ten Commandments. So instead of all that stuff, well, I can now just refer to my checklist of rules. Right? I don't actually need all the mythology anymore. Now I've got law. Right? So remember what I said before about mythology being the womb of all of these things. We're hearing the story. How did law begin? 
You, know, you see this in, in Babylon as well, the laws of Hammurabi. Same thing is invoked very explicitly in Buddhism. The Vinaya text, which gives the Buddhist monastic law, it's explicitly a legal code. And the first chapter of that, the first chapter of the first Kandika, begins with the Buddha's enlightenment. Right? The story of the whole Buddha's enlightenment and all that kind of stuff. Where do we find that? In the Vinaya, book on monastic law. Why? What's it doing there? It's doing there because if you know that the Buddha was enlightened, and then when he says, monks, clean the bathroom, <laughs> you're going to listen to him. Right? Well, it's the Buddha that, who says that, right? Because it establishes the authority, right? And so, a lot of mythology, especially this, uh, the great mythology, is about establishing an authority, a lineage of kings, right? The rightness of this particular civilization. Why do these people rule, right? Why do we worship this particular god, right? All of these kinds of things. So we've, so we're setting up this archaic authority. But by doing so then we don't need the mythology anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of interesting kind of cycle of it. it myth is consuming its own tale. Right, yeah, I mean, it's, it's their ancestors. You know, it's connected and they learn from it, but it's not us as such. Yeah, yeah. It's the people of old. And then, that, and that's where the nostalgia comes in as well. You know, all oh, the heroes of those days were so brave and so strong. Yeah. So I talked earlier about this idea that all, that all mythology is about the death of God. But the death of God is also something else. The death of God ultimately is a narrative device to tell the real story, the birth of consciousness. Does it make sense? Think about it in terms, again, of infant development. Yeah? For an infant, its parents are its gods. The child growing up, mum and dad are God. But for that child to become its own person, mum and dad can't be gods anymore. And if there's a, an adult who thinks of their parents as being gods, there's something's gone wrong. Yeah? Something's gone wrong. So the death of God, and again, I'm not saying that's what mythology is, I'm saying that's one dimension or one way of looking at it. So the death of God is a narrative device to tell the real story, the birth of consciousness. And one of the most beautiful expressions of this, and those of you who've heard my Dhamma talks on various things will have heard me quoting this many times, the Gayatri Mantra. And one of the most famous and powerful, probably the most famous and powerful mantras in the Vedic corpus, Om Bhur Bhuvaswa Tat Savitur Varinyang Bhargo Devasya Dimahi Dihoyo Naha Prachodayan. Which is not an easy one to, to translate, but roughly translate, let us contemplate that glorious rising sun whose divine awa radiance awakens our minds. And this is sung by the Brahmins at the dawn and also figures in many important ceremonies, especially the coming-of-age ceremonies of young Brahmin men. And so this idea that, that our minds, our awareness, is starting to wake up, yeah? emerging from the darkness of the night into the day. And so in Jungian psychology, Jungian interpretation of myth, will say that, that in mythology the hero is always searching for something, is always looking for something. But ultimately what they're looking for is their self. And that idea of the hero's journey being essentially a so search for spiritual truth, the higher spiritual truth, is implicit throughout many of... It's the subtext in most of the, the mythologies of the world. But of course in the Buddha's life, <laughs> it's not subtext anymore. It's quite clearly that's what he's doing, right? He's searching for awakening, he's searching for the highest truth. In, in the story of the Buddha, you may be familiar with the idea that the Buddha was faced with two choices, to be a world-turning monarch or to be a fully awakened Buddha. That is to search for 
worldly success or to search for spiritual success. But that twofold quest was already found 2,000 years before the Buddha in the oldest of the epic hero myths, the, the myth of Gilgamesh. And the Babylonian myth of Gilgamesh tells the story of how, how, how Gilgamesh with his great friend Enkidu went to the forests of Lebanon to get the cedar for building their city. And they, they fought the great monster Humbaba in the forest. Ha, Gilgamesh had prophetic dreams the whole lot. When they came back, they were fated as being great heroes. So much so that the goddess came to uh, sleep with Enkidu. He said, okay, you're pretty hot. I like a bit of hero action. Here I'm going to have... And Enkidu said, no. Why? Because here are these stories of the men that the goddess slept with. And he related all of these stories, right? This is the oldest myth that we've got. And he's already telling stories about older myths. Yeah? So I'm not going to have anything to do with it. You're too dangerous. So he got, she got really pissed off. No, sorry, it was Gilgamesh she wanted to sleep in. She got pissed off with him and killed Enkidu, his mate. Right? And so Gilgamesh was struck with great grief and wanted to find a way of bringing his friend back to life. And he went on this second search. So the first search was to the cedar forest to get wood. Very straightforward. Second search was to find immortality. And the second search is weird. He goes through all of these strange tunnels and meets weird creatures and has to go these different quests and all of these kinds of things. It's very, very strange. And he fails. He fails to, to win the deathless. So that, that idea that we're looking for consciousness, looking for awakening, is something which is fundamental in the mythology. And so this was summed up, I think, very beautifully by uh, Roberto Calasso, one of the most beautiful modern writers on mythology. Uh, and his uh, book on Greek mythology, The Mad Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony, is uh, a classic of the genre. And his book on Indian mythology, Ka, is most recommended. And what he said in Ka was the Buddha came to put an end to gesture. And what he meant by that was that in earlier religiosity was externally orientated through ritual, through word, through observance, through all of those things. And the Buddha said, no, we look inside. It's the mind that matters. It's consciousness that matters. And so the Buddha, even though the, the, the Buddha's own life story was made into this very grand myth, the Buddha himself was coming to put an end to the world of myth and to move us into a new way of seeing and a new way of knowing. So that's all I have for you this evening. It looks like we've run out of time also, so we should wrap up there. Look, uh, I... I... Thank you so much for being here. I think we've probably run out of time for questions, but I'll hang around for a bit if anybody wants to ask questions. I will leave a bit more time for questions in subsequent sessions, okay? So, and we'll open it up a bit more. Um, but uh, thank you so much for your attention so far, and I hope that that's been as uh, inter interesting and worthwhile for you as it has been for me. Uh, and next week, let's come back and have a look at the uh, especially a closer look at the Jataka stories and how mythic motifs and ideas are reflected in the Jatakas. Thank you so much.